Humanity is innumerable, spread across the stars, with a military might befitting a galaxy-spanning empire like the Imperium. And yet, for all their numbers, there are a few individuals within humanity, or those who are ascended beyond it, who have become renowned even beyond their peers. In this series of logs, we shall take a look at some of those Adeptus Astartes of particular legend in this modern era, known collectively as the Champions of Humanity. Today, we return to the home of a previously explored champion to look at an individual who is truly unique amongst the sons of his Primarch. Despite succumbing to the floor of his gene seed and the gene seed within them all, he alone amongst his chapter has been able to not only contain but defeat this curse and emerge from it all the stronger. He now stands as the leader of the chapter's Librarius, one of the most powerful psychers in all of the Adeptus Astartes, capable of facing down some of the most powerful demons ever witnessed. Formerly known as Calistarius, he is now the chief librarian of the Blood Angels. He is the Lord of Death. He is Mephiston. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to Champions of Humanity, a 40k Stories miniseries. The origins of the individual known today as Mephiston are exceptionally unclear. As he would go on to be a blood angel, we can be pretty sure he was born on Baal or one of its moons, and the dates we have records of suggest that this was around about 450 to 550 M41. We assume that his name was Calistarius, as there's no evidence of blood angels changing their name on ascension to the ranks of the Astartes, and unlike others, it seems as though his induction went relatively smoothly. Probably during this induction process, he was examined by the librarians of the chapter for traces of psychic ability. Exactly what percentage of recruits do have these powers is unknown, as is the timing at which this happens in the induction or transformation. Once Calistarius's powers were detected, a secondary test was undertaken to ensure that the potential recruit would have the mental strength and force of will to cut it as a librarian. Calistarius is noted as having exceptional character, so assumedly passed this test with flying colours before becoming a full librarian trainee, as well as becoming a space marine in general. How they're trained to fight is unclear, given they don't seem to serve in the scout company, but I'm sure they do something. In combination with his supposedly prodigious psychic abilities even back then, the strength of will of Calistarius probably saw him do well in his training. And though we don't know how long it took, he eventually earned the rank of Lexicanium. This role usually involves a lot of bookkeeping and report writing, but I would be curious how much fighting it entails relative to the higher ranks like Codicia or Epistolary, who obviously have more control over their abilities. Either way, Calistarius obviously impressed even as a Lexicanium, as in 589M41, he was tasked alongside most of the first company under Captain Raphael with cleansing the space hulk Sin of Damnation that had appeared not too far from Baal itself. The hulk itself was infested with gene stealers, which is somewhat interesting given the Tyranids wouldn't arrive en masse for over 150 years, but then gene stealers are considered forerunners to the Great Devourer, so we can't excuse it. It also contained an artifact of the Blood Angels, though how it came to be there I cannot be sure, and as the Blood Angels had also almost lost their entire chapter to a Space Hulk centuries prior, it became a very important mission. Calistarius' role was that of prediction and psychic beatstick, which made him a very valuable asset despite his detachment from everybody else. Though only 80 Space Marines went in, over 40,000 Gene Stealers died and the artifact was recovered as well with Calistarius proving absolutely priceless. I suspect the presence of a psychic broodlord on board had a lot to do with that, since Terminator armor isn't exactly super helpful against mind powers. After the Sin of Damnation's cleansing, Calistarius basically fell off the grid for centuries. We know little to nothing of his deeds or ranks, etc., until the last action he would undertake under that name. In the closing stages of the Second War for Armageddon, Calistarius was part of the relief force sent to try and save Hades' hive. The orcs were already reeling thanks to the Blood Angel-led Space Marine Coalition, but the Greenskins were still able to collapse the hive that Commissar Yarrick had so doggedly defended throughout the war. However, Calistarius would not arrive at Hades in a state one can call sane, as the curse of the Gene Seed of Sanguinius struck him down. Yes, 
Calistarius succumbed to the Black Rage and was thus part of the Death Company during the assault on Hades, likely seeing traitors in place of orcs or perhaps living out Sanguinius's final moments. It is unknown whether he was capable of unleashing any psychic power in this state, but he and the rest of the Death Company were, as always, a powerful entity, and in the closing stages they were part of the assault on the Ecclesiarchal facility in the Hive. The fighting here, combined with the stress that the siege and war uh, that engulfed the Hive, proved too much for the building which collapsed on the combatants, killing just about everyone. I say just about because, despite being buried in rubble, Calistarius somehow yet lived. For a week he was trapped beneath the masonry and whatever else, fighting not only probably severe injury, but also his own mind, which of course remained in the grip of the Black Rage. Finally, seven days after his entrapment, the body of Calistarius rose clear of the rubble, but this was no mad librarian seeing things that weren't there. Instead, Calistarius had managed to defeat the Black Rage, forcing it down with naught but willpower, but to say he was the man he had been before would be entirely wrong as well. In place of Calistarius stood Mephiston, the Lord of Death, who showed immediately that he was not to be trifled with as a mob of orcs were drawn by the noise of his escape from the Collapse. Despite being unarmed and with all but broken armour, Mephiston tore the Greenskins apart in seconds with an unbelievable speed and vigour, before walking back to the Imperial forces that had mostly retaken the Broken Hive by that point. From there, the reborn Mephiston returned to much awe and likely much fanfare, and over the coming years his rise to leadership of the Blood Angels Librarius would be pretty damn meteoric. We don't have the exact date for his ascension to the rank of Chief Librarian, nor who he replaced or how, but he got there pretty quickly, despite misgivings from some who knew Calistarius. In his role as Chief Librarian of the Blood Angels, Mephiston has seen combat many times and played a pivotal role in said combats on several occasions. Despite taking the post presumably by 950 M41, it would be several years before he is known to have actually had a fight, and it was a battle he was forced to wage alone. In 965 M41, through presumed shenanigans, Mephiston was entrapped in crystalline caverns on a world called Solon V, location and classification sadly both unknown. The architect of this was the demon prince Amkar, formerly Malok Kartho of the Crusade era word bearers, who desired to turn Mephiston to the worship of chaos and claim that Mephiston was already well on the way to demonhood. Whether true or not, Mephiston certainly had no intention of taking Amkar up on his offer and attacked, winning out over the demon and banishing him like so many before and after him. Amkar's actually dead for good now thanks to Marnius Kalgar and Uriel Ventris. He didn't have the best run of success even before his ascension and certainly not after it. The rest of Mephiston's actions on Solon V are sadly lost to history, and it would be several decades until he would enter the history books again. This came in the year of 992 M41 on the hive world of Holonan, location unknown but presumed in the Galactic East given the opposition. Originally, Mephiston led a small detachment against what was believed to be a simple but probably major uprising on the hive world but it was quickly revealed that the agents of the Hive Mind were at work and a Gene Stealer cult was behind the insurrection. Of course, a Gene Stealer cult uprising is almost always a harbinger for an oncoming Tyranid Hive Fleet, and so it proved here as a tendril of Hive Fleet Kraken arrived and invaded Holonan. The cult was purged by the Astartes just too late to stop the invasion, and the hopelessly outnumbered Mephiston sought aid from his own chapter and the successors the Angels Vermilion but he would also be joined by an unforeseen ally in the forces of the Eldari craft world Ulthway. In the time before the arrival of these allies both summoned and uninvited, Mephiston was able to kill the Hive Tyrant of the Tyranids, but was struck down by a Trigon before the Tyranids were routed and crushed. He lived though, because he's Mephiston, and once he had been recovered by his brothers, the Farseer Eldrad Ulthran took his leave from Holonan and ended their temporary alliance. Following this, Mephiston would have become embroiled in two major incidents that threatened the survival and the sanctity of the Blood Angels. 
The dates are almost identical, both in 999M41, but the first of the incidents was almost certainly the civil war within the Sons of Sanguinius known as the Archeo Insurrection. The Space Marine Archeo had been ever so subtly corrupted by the power of Zinch through a hidden traitor Inquisitor. And despite this corruption, he was able to recover the Spear of Telesto, a weapon originally used by none other than Sanguinius himself. The curse upon Archeo saw him began to mutate into the likeness of the Primarch, even going so far as to sprout the signature wings of Sanguinius. And eventually the Blood Angels around him began to think he really was Sanguinius reborn, though his biological brother Raphon remained unconvinced. Having already defied the orders of Chapter Master Dante once, the now delusional Archeo began to raise an army that would take control of the Blood Angels from the veteran commander. But thanks to Raphon, Dante was able to put Mephiston in charge of an investigation. In truth, Mephiston didn't do much to personally take Archeo down. His initial investigation team was killed, and after meeting and denouncing the mutated Astartes personally, his intended duel was interrupted by Raven, who took the place of the Lord of Death. Archeo was actually slain eventually by Raven, but many other deluded Blood Angels will have likely still died fighting Mephiston or the loyal brothers that were with him. Finally, with the supposedly reborn Sanguinius dead, the architect of the corruption made itself known as the Lord of Change Malfalax possessed the treacherous Inquisitor and attempted to unleash the Black Rage on all the Blood Angels present. Though the demon would be banished by the power of the Spear of Telesto, its work had somewhat succeeded, and despite conquering the Black Rage once before to be reborn as Mephiston, the Librarian supposedly fell into its grip once again. This time, it is unknown whether Calistarius or wherever he had become could beat the rage, but fortunately, he did not have to, as Raphon turned the spear on Mephiston. Exactly how or why, I don't know, but this act and the power of the spear were able to break the hold of the Black Rage and return Mephiston for a second time. In the aftermath of the incident, Mephiston was cast as the judge over the lives and gene seed of the Blood Angels of Sixth Company who had followed Archeo. Though Raphon's sanctity was no longer in doubt due to his use of the spear, the rest of the company, both living and dead, were in the librarian's hands, and he showed a measure of clemency unbefitting of someone said to have little to no humanity left. The judgment of the gene seed was deferred to Chapter Master Dante, and the survivors of Sixth Company were to be given a chance to redeem themselves, even if many would die in the rites of cleansing that would precede this opportunity. Mephiston's assumed last known act before the close of M41 was as part of the unofficial reunion of the Blood Angels Legion. The Chief Librarian is not mentioned as being part of the Cryptus campaign, perhaps due to commitments elsewhere, perhaps Archeo and Raphon, but after the victory in Cryptus, and I use that term tenuously, he was back on bar with his brothers as the Tyranid High Fleet Leviathan still encroached toward the home of the chapter. However, whilst Dante was busy fortifying and calling for those sired by the Blood Angels to help defend Baal, the Lord of Death uncovered a second, perhaps even greater threat heading their way. In a dream-slash-vision in his chambers alongside the former chief librarians and their corpses, because that's the thing the Blood Angels do, Mephiston was shown snippets of events surrounding both Cadia's fall and the siege of the Fenris system, before conversing with a Harlequin that had presumably set him up to see it all. Said Harlequin then sent the Librarian to witness Korn's realm, despite the inherent risk to a Psyker in the Blood God's domain. There, Mephiston saw perhaps the worst thing he could have seen. A Banda, the Angel's Bane and sworn enemy of the Sons of Sanguinius, making ready to return to the Materium. After delivering the first part of the news to Dante, Mephiston visited an ancient Xenos creature held prisoner on Baal by the name of the Octo Calvary. By dominating the mind of the corrupted seer, he was able to validate his suspicions of Kabanda's coming before reporting back to his chapter master. Knowing full well that the appearance of the Bloodthirster during a war with the Tyranids could damn the Blood Angels and their successors in the worst possible way, Mephiston was tasked with stopping Kabanda at any cost by Dante. To that end, he and a conclave of librarians for the Blood Angels and others were gathered and dispatched to conduct a dark ritual hoping to stop, or at least delay, the Angel's Bane. Flying out into the invading Tyranid swarm, thanks in no small part to Mephiston keeping them safe with his abilities, 
the conclave travelled to a place known as the Ruberica, or the Heart of Baal. Mephiston, enhancing his own power with that of his brothers around him, projected himself into Korn's round once again to confront the advancing Kabanda head on. Unfortunately for the Lord of Death, this was to be a fruitless endeavour, and though Kabanda was somewhat wounded, he was able to break through the defence of the librarians, killing many and ultimately entering reality. Though the Angel's Bane would emerge on Baal Primus with the aid of the Cicatrix Maledictum, effectively slaying all on the moon before returning to the warp once more, the Librarian Conclave would have no further part to play in what became known as the Devastation of Baal. Both depleted in numbers and strength, as well as being buried within the heart of Baal, Mephiston and the others would not bear witness to the near fall of the Arx Angelicum, the fortress monastery of the Blood Angels, nor would they be part of the final glorious charge of the Sons of Sanguinius in which Dante would slay the Swarm Lord. However, they would eventually dig themselves out of the mountains and return to find that not only had their chapter somehow survived despite all that happened, but that they and the other Sons of Sanguinius were to be reborn and rebuilt through the Primaris Space Marines given by the returned Primarch Robert Gilliman. Mephiston's opinion on the Primaris seems unclear, at least to my mind. He's not opposed to the concept like, for example, Gabriel Seth, but he does recognise the fact that he is among the last of his kind amongst the Blood Angels, given the amount of Primaris needed to top them up. There aren't many classic marines left in that chapter now, and that number is only going to dwindle. How much action he has seen since the dawn of this new era is currently unknown, but with demonic threats slightly more present than ever, and his chapter master being Imperium Nihilus's regent, I suspect the Lord of Death has been kept exceptionally busy as both warrior, counsel, and guide into the future. Finally, let us look briefly at Mephiston's weapons and personality, though I use that term loosely in the latter case since Mephiston is rather unique. As befits a librarian of his stature, Mephiston is armed with a force weapon, in this case the Force Sword Vitaris. The sword is presumably pretty damn old, maybe dating all the way back to the days of Sanguinius himself. Legend says that the Primarch personally blessed the weapon with a drop of his own blood, though whether this would affect the power of the weapon I am unsure. It may have just been symbolic, but with Primarchs and Sanguinius's blood, you can never really be sure. Vitaris is already dangerous, being a force weapon in the hands of a fighter and psyker like Mephiston, but in his hands it can burn with crimson flame, perhaps symbolic of the rage that once consumed Mephiston or that burns within him still like all of the Blood Angels. Mephiston also wields a plasma pistol, though it's not believed to be of any significance, and is clad in a very unique suit of artificer armour. It is not known to have much heritage, but the high collar-like psychic hood and the resemblance to a flayed bloody chest is certainly not something that you see every day. However, it is the personality, or lack of it, in Mephiston that draws many queries. For one thing, it is unclear whether Mephiston and Calistarius are actually really the same person, or at the very least, the same soul. The Harlequin who showed him the vision of Kabanda referred to him as two-soul Mephiston, and we do know that M. Carr said he was part way to demonhood. Both groups are renowned for lying to get their way, but the fact they're so diametrically opposed yet both call Mephiston's soul into doubt could be seen as somewhat telling. In fact, during the devastation of Baal there was a moment where, for want of a better descriptor, he felt himself coming apart, Mephiston from Calistarius. There are those amongst his brothers who sometimes can see hints of the old guy, but it's pretty rare even for those who were close to Calistarius, but even still, there are whispers of a darker power in his resurrection or rebirth. When the successors gathered to defend Baal, he was called out by one member for the fact that he simply should not be. His retort was simply, but I do, therefore I am. Whatever the truth is, Mephiston seems to keep his own counsel on the matter, it may be that he and only he has all of the facts pertaining to his creation, but we cannot be sure. One thing is for certain though, Mephiston is not human. To be completely fair, this is true of all the Astartes to a greater or lesser extent, since they have transcended humanity in their ascension to become a space marine. However, Mephiston seems to go way beyond that, with no empathy for or attachment to even the others in the Blood Angels, or anyone else for that matter. He is distant, cold, perhaps even emotionless to the minds of some, and even will personally say he has no empathy. 
but the fact remains he is one of the most potent psychers ever to be sired from a legion that was already more psychic than most. Without his abilities, he's a killing machine, but with the ability to literally fly and unleash devastating blasts or augment himself ridiculously, he becomes a juggernaut of destruction that is nigh impossible to stop. Dante clearly trusts him at least enough, giving him free reign to stop Cabanta despite knowing the risks, but he will always be a step apart from those who call Calistarius brother. This is a shame to my mind, as anyone with the strength to conquer the Black Rage would be someone you'd expect to be lauded or perhaps even venerated, but his personality and the apprehension about his nature makes this rather impossible. If you're curious about Calistarius' personality, there isn't much to say in all truth. He was said to be quite isolationist, partly due to his abilities, and perhaps even lacking in empathy as a result. So possibly the personality that we see in Mephiston, it's just a cranked up version of who he was before. Whether that leads credence to them being one soul, one mind, etc., I leave up to you. It's an interesting question for sure. So ends the tale of Mephiston and or Calistarius. Though likely a high value prospect even before his fall on Armageddon, since his resurrection, Mephiston has proved himself to have an indomitable will and almost unparalleled psychic power. Uniquely able to beat back the curse that has blighted his Primarch's sons for millennia, the Lord of Death stands apart from, yet together with, his fellow Blood Angels as a new era dawns for the descendants of Sanguinius. Only time will tell what Mephiston's legacy will be, either as a dark, whispered legend, or an idolised hero, or anything in between. But whilst he stands alone somewhat today, he is an asset unlike most any other, and certainly deserves his place in the history books. If nothing else, this is a psyker who can go into Korn's realm, stare down Kabanda, and wound him severely without dying. Seriously, that is impressive. I hope you've enjoyed this latest log in Champions of Humanity, looking at the greatest of the modern era Astartes. Since we looked at the Psyker this time, I think it is fair that in our next log, we look at a very psychic race. Actually, that's only half true, as I wish to explore the pantheon of that race and their gods, looking into the event that changed the galaxy and the species forever. For now though, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.